Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. The EU's top tech regulator, Marguerite Vestager, says that AI could be as disruptive as the atomic bomb. Big tech and AI regulation are at the top of the agenda today as EU officials gather in Washington with leaders in government and technology. I'm pleased to say that joining us now is Marguerite Vestager. She is executive vice president of the European Commission. Joining me, too, is Bloomberg's own Anne-Marie Hordern. And Marguerite, great to have you with us. Let's start, of course, well, thank with... Thank you very much for having me. Really looking forward to this conversation. I want to talk about the EU. It said three months ago that it was going to investigate the relationship between Microsoft and OpenAI. Are you able to share any findings of that probe so far? Well, not so far. Uh, we're also comparing note with, uh, with other authorities because obviously it's, it's top of mind for us to make sure that the market stays competitive when everything gets fueled uh, by artificial intelligence. It's, it's going to change the marketplace. Do you have a timeline at all, Commissioner, when we could potentially see some movement on this? No, we don't have a fixed timeline. Uh, of course, we want to produce results as fast as possible, also for the involved uh, companies, for, for their benefit. Uh, we'll be getting there uh, soon, I think. So we're talking about Microsoft and OpenAI, but of course, they're not the only players here. You have Amazon, actually, uh, with a big, almost $3 billion investment into Anthropic, which, of course, competes with OpenAI. What do you make of that? Is that something that you're looking at as well? Well, we will be, be having, you know, a, a vigilant, keen attention uh, to what is happening uh, in this field. Um, we see a lot of entrenched market power when it comes to technology. And it's really important that now when we have technology, which is not just a new technology, it's, it's basically a new world that we're looking into, uh, that we make sure that it's a competitive uh, new world. You just recently, under the DMA, went after three big U.S. tech companies. And to be honest, Commissioner, three is a crowd. I'm really curious to know which of these you are honing in on. And because a lot of people really seem to think it's Apple, where the EU has a lot of problems with. Well, what's the, the point of the, the Digital Markets Act is to open the market, to make sure that, that more businesses can, can get to their customers so customers have more choice. So, uh, obviously, uh, we are looking at um, uh, getting out of self-preferencing so that you do not, if you, for instance, have a Google search, and you do not just get a Google product. Uh, and we're looking at how businesses can get a real relationship with their customers. So to get rid of, uh, of the anti-staring uh, that we see quite a lot, and people have choice if they want to stay in the Apple payment environment or they want to have a direct and sometimes cheaper uh, relationship uh, with their service provider. Well, among those three, Apple, Google, and Meta, do you have a priority target? Well, we have opened these five cases because we think these are very important. Uh, we may have more cases in the pipeline, so we have uh, given retaining orders for what may be uh, evidence uh, once we're moving forward. Uh, these five cases, they are all priority. We think that they are absolutely key uh, if our suspicions are confirmed. Uh, that we get uh, compliance because this is this is what opens the market and that's the that's the basic idea of the Digital Markets Act for many more businesses to have a fair chance to get to their customers. Commissioner, there's currently a lot of bipartisan support in Washington to rein in big tech. It's one of these rare policies where you have the likes of Elizabeth Warren and J.D. Vance lining up behind the same issue. Do you think potentially, given this bipartisanship we see in this space, and given the fact that we also see the FTC going after these companies as well, that the U.S. may do the work for you and assuage the commission's concerns? Well, um, I don't think so. Everybody will have to do their own job. Uh, but I really appreciate uh, when things are moving forward here uh, because, you know, we are so much stronger when we are a bigger community. So if, uh, if the U.S. Would, uh, would join in for also with a, a legislative uh, background, I think that would be great. That would be a, an even faster uh, way to make sure that the digital market serves consumers well. Well, following up on that point, how are you thinking about the U.S. as a partner in some of these efforts? What degree of coordination of talking is there between the two sides, of course, as you go after big tech and AI? 
Well, actually, I, I think the relationship today is better than it has been for, for decades. Uh, within the, the framework of the Trade and Technology Council, you know, we agreed very early on on the approach to artificial intelligence to be uh, risk-based. Uh, we just very recently um, decided uh, to see, can we set common standards? For instance, what is actually red teaming? What do you have to do in order to tick that box? Uh, what is watermarking? How, how can you tick that box that we as, as consumers can see what is a fake, what is a deep fake? So, so the relationship is very close. Uh, it's very good. Uh, and I think that that increases uh, the chances uh, that we can actually have an open competitive market that promotes, uh, promotes innovation also when it comes to these services. There's one U.S. company that the EU has yet to go after, that many are waiting, that potentially could be the next one, and that's NVIDIA. Do you plan to o open a formal probe into this company? Well, even if we did, you know, I would, I would not share that with you. That is kind of the things that we keep Well, are you ourselves. concerned about so their can, chip I... market dominance at all? Well, I, I would not comment on that. Okay. Um, all right. Well, I guess that potentially means this is one of those wait to be seen. I would love to also exactly. get your. Uh, I'm kind of taking that as potentially that's a yes, but if you don't want to comment, we'll leave it there. Uh, Katie and I would also like to get your thoughts on what is going on with China, because this week you also opened up a probe into the China wind markets. We have seen for years China dump solar technology onto the European market. What have you learned from the past when it came to solar that now you're looking into when it comes to wind? Well, we recognize uh, what we see as a Chinese playbook, uh, inviting uh, European companies uh, to joint ventures, transferring technology, uh, heavy Chinese subsidies uh, in the Chinese market to build capacity closing off uh, their own markets uh, towards foreign uh, businesses, and then to start export at prices which are basically not for anyone to compete with. And the result in the solar market is that by now, only 3% of installed capacity when it comes to solar is actually produced in Europe. And, uh, and knowing that you have been played, of course, teaches you that you need to watch up, watch out to be much more um, observant uh, and take better action. So we're using both our trade tools and our tools that comes with the foreign subsidies regulation in full uh, in order to restore fair competition. Where does this leave EVs then? Because this is something that the Biden administration is keenly focused on, and they continue to talk about the fact that there might be more tariffs on Chinese EVs coming into the United States. Where are we with the EU probe on Chinese electric vehicles? It's my colleagues, Valdis Dombrovsky, who's, who's leading that probe from a trade perspective. It's a priority case for them, obviously, because Europe is, is one of the big open markets when it comes uh, to EVs and, uh, and the Chinese market share in Europe is increasing uh, quite dramatically. Uh, so this is absolutely top priority, but they do not have the final results yet. I do want to move from China to Russia because certain EU nations, they're continuing to import quantities of Russian LNG. And the commission, you had previously had concerns that Gazprom had artificially restricted supplies to really inflate prices. Can you share what the status of that investigation is? Well, that has been uh, a bit quiet for, for quite some time uh, because of, uh, of the war, because things are, are really uh, politically uh, steered uh, by now. Uh, of course, we see the inputs, but I think what is much more important is that now you've had a full diversification in Europe when it comes to gas imports, both pipeline and, uh, and LNG. By now, we buy so much more LNG from uh, American uh, producers and obviously very thankful uh, for, for that supply uh, coming into Europe because that strengthens our independence and it, it cuts the dependency that we used to have on, uh, on Russian supply. Commissioner, it's not lost on me that you're talking about thanking the U.S. You're sitting in Washington, D.C., yet the Biden administration is having a pause now on LNG permits. How concerning is that to Europe's national security, given the fact that Europe has pretty much replaced Russia for your LNG imports? Well, as far as, as we know the consequences of that decision, it doesn't affect uh, the imports that are happening and the contracts that has been 
uh, been signed. So we think that we're good also because here we do not only rely on the U.S. We have many more, both from Norway to uh, some more uh, Middle Eastern uh, suppliers and African suppliers in this. Because diversification, I think that is the new black. Everyone wants to know that if something happens somewhere, that you're still safe to give, you, give your, uh, your supply from other sources. I just want to also end with this potential of the U.S. election. I know this is something you're not going to want to comment on at length, but... The former president, Donald Trump, is the front runner, is the nominee, and potentially this time next year, we will have a Trump as a president next time you come visit the United States, potentially. He once said that he, quote, that you, quote, hate the United States and that you're perhaps, quote, worse than any person he's ever met. How do you plan to work with a Trump 2.0 administration? Well, actually, I have never met uh, Donald Trump. Uh, so I, I don't know uh, how he, he built this assessment. And I think I have proven uh, beyond reasonable doubt in the workings within the Trade and Technology Council and with colleagues on the competition side of things that I have a very, very strong, uh, if, if not love, uh, then like of, uh, of the United States. All right, Marguerite, I think that's a good place to end it. Really appreciate your time today. That, of course, is Marguerite Vestire. She is Executive Vice President of the European Commission. And, of course, our thanks to our own Bloomberg's Emery Hordern.